everyone hear me? Good? Yeah. Are we happy to be here this morning? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Here we go. Yeah. I'm regulation, so I'm boring. I need the enthusiasm up front. So I will apologize to begin with. I know it's, it's right, it's boring. Um, as was mentioned, I'm Lynette Havisel. I'm with Chicago EPA. I've been doing the stormwater program for, I hate to say this, but slightly over 17 years. Um, hope to be doing it for many more. But uh, Randy mentioned the stormwater pollution, the common things we see, the causes of stormwater pollution. I'm kind of here to take you to that next step. We have a problem, you know, what do we do about it? Well, that's what Ohio EPA is tasked with. Um, back in the 70s, we had the Water <coughs> Act, the Burning Cuyahoga. Um, obviously, water quality was a problem. And Congress came up with the Clean Water Act, which said you're going to have NPDES permits. And certain sources like wastewater treatment plants um, have these permits to regulate the amount of pollutants they discharge. Uh, there was a lot of success with this program. But what happened over time was we noticed that when we took out these, these really nasty big point sources um, and there was water quality improvements, we still weren't getting where we needed to be at that fishable drinkable ability. Um, and why was that? Well, it was attributed to stormwater. If you don't manage the stormwater, we're going to still have poor water quality. So what happened after that was Congress came back with the amendments to the Clean Water Act. Um, I'll discuss that a little bit more later. But, you know, Randy pointed out these issues. We have these people who are dumping things. We see these things coming out of our outfalls, our storm sewer outfalls. How do we fix it? Well, the jargon of the day in this field, it's best management practices, or BMPs. Um, BMPs can be anything. It doesn't have to be a structural control. It can be a procedure. It can be your SOP. How do we, how do, we do business in a way that minimizes or prevents pollutants from entering our stormwater? Um, when we're looking at stormwater and we're, we're thinking about best management practices, two main components which you got to look at. We, we tackle this by reducing the volume of runoff that comes into contact with pollutants, or we tackle <coughs> this by minimizing the pollutants themselves that are entering the stormwater. So we can do volume and rate control. We can target sources, kind of a two-pronged attack there. Um, so stormwater BMPs, they will work by reducing exposure pollutants. In this case, you know, we have some outside storage. Clearly we got some stuff migrating off the property into the neighboring ditch. Um, you know, we can provide cover to that activity. So when we're doing material transfer or material storage, that's not exposed to runoff. Whether you put a roof on it, whether you put a tarp on it, whether you bring it inside, um, you know, whether you're just practicing really good housekeeping. Minimizing the exposure of the pollutant itself to stormwater runoff. Other methods involve that volume reduction. Um, and this, this has a side benefit in that it can also help address some flooding issues. Um, can we maintain that runoff on site? Can we get it to infiltrate in? Reduce that volume of runoff. And thereby we're not getting as many clues picked up and discharged from the site. Um, what you have here on the left, you have a parking area, um, which is permeable. The, the pavers or the grass will go up in between us. You, know, you don't use this parking area very much, so therefore you can have this less rigid system that provides a lot more infiltration. We have a green roof there in the center. Um, again, you get a lot more backward transpiration with these systems. Uh, and then on the far right, what you have is a permeable pavement. And I don't know if any of you have seen a demonstration of this project or product. <coughs> it's very fun to watch because you can just take a hose and pour all the water you want on this thing and it's gone. Um, it goes down below, and depending on how you set up your system down below, you can have a lot more infiltration, um, or it, it would be need some treatment before it discharges through under drains and things to site. But it's a really neat product. It looks kind of like Rice Krispie treats, that, that consistency. Um, but it does have some benefits. Last but not least, um, and maybe coming back to that, that mine sewer, separating storm sewers and, and sanitary sewers question, why do we separate it out if we're going to have to treat? Um, this is why. There are better ways to handle things. It is sometimes much more cost effective to 
to keep the pollutants from getting into the stormwater um, than it is to treat. But a last resort can be a treatment. Uh, when we're talking about municipalities and sewer separation, um, it costs a lot of money to run a wastewater treatment plant and a lot of effort and a lot of manpower. There's so many babysitting, <coughs> there's electricity, there's chemical costs. There are more passive treatment systems for storm sewer systems, whether it's uh, a sand filter, um, a, you know, as simple as a pond. You know, we do have to maintain these practices, but it's not that 24-7 ongoing maintenance and operation issue that you have with a wastewater treatment plant. Um, and on the far side, you have you know, what, what is a hydrodynamic separator. Um, water goes in, and you know, we can have some removal of oil and grease, depending on how the design is. Some of the larger particulates might get removed by this type of a system. But best management practices, you know, they might involve capital costs, but what we want to encourage people is to think of the other ways, not a capital improvement, but there are management practices that just involve a change of, of awareness. Um, you know, looking at that painter, he doesn't have to rinse his brush off in the storm drain. Um, so awareness, education, Source controls usually are much more effective than treatment is. So where does EPA come into this? Our job when it comes to stormwater and what came out of the Clean Water Act in 1987, the amendments to the Clean Water Act, we are tasked with um, either through the, the 319 program, which some of you might be familiar with. That program addresses non-point sources of pollution. It is more of a grant-oriented program get BMP implementation. Uh, my end is the NPDES permit side, and that is where we get BMP implementation through NPDES permits. In the stormwater land, we do BMPs and permits for construction sites, industrial sites, and municipal separate storm sewer systems, or MS4s is what we call them. So in our construction permit, um, and these are these are NPDES permits. These are all permits to discharge pollutants from stormwater into a surface water. And what our construction permit would require someone to do, um, if you have a construction activity, and this is any earth disturbance, clearing, grading, grubbing, excavating, or filling, um, if you disturb one acre or more, you need an NPDES permit from Ohio EPA. And what this permit will say is you're going to have a <coughs> plan called a stormwater pollution prevention plan or SWIP. And that script's going to tell what best management practices you're going to implement, uh, when they get implemented, which ones you're picking, how they're going to be designed, how they're going to be maintained. Um, the only earth disturbing activities we do not regulate are agriculture and subculture. That is because con Congress statutorily exempted those from NPDES permit program. Um, if you have a question as to whether an activity is truly agriculture or subculture, give us a call. We're happy to discuss the situation. Um, there are some, some twists on that. Uh, you know, removing a, a tree or removing a woods for subdivision is not considered civil culture. That would be a construction activity. That would be something that we would regulate. So like I said, if you have a question, give us a call. We're happy to walk through things with you. Um, like I said, construction drill permit. So you gotta develop a plan that tells what PMPs you're implementing. You know, who, what, where, and why is what this, this plan is going to tell on the, on the BMPs. Um, the permit will direct BMP selection and the timing of the BMPs, um, but there's still a lot of freedom for choice in there to, to pick the best controls for your site. Um, essential areas that this permit address would be sediment and erosion controls, um, non-sediment pollutant controls, and post-construction stormwater management. So there's going to be BMP selected for site for each of these different categories. Now an erosion control is something um, that keeps the soil in place, prevents it from being picked up and moved with the runoff. And pretty much this is cover. Some kind of cover in the soil is what we're looking for. You know, whether it's seeding and matting, whether it's a stone home road, if you're going to have a paved surface, just put the stone down, that's perfectly acceptable cover. Um, you know, we have a mat matting in the soil over there. Sediment control is an after the fact. The dirt's picked up, the sediment's being carried by the runoff. We're in treatment mode now. It's something that causes usually the water to pond so that the dirt will sell out. It can be a sediment pond, it can be inlet protection, um, it can be that silt fence barrier. Basically, if, if you don't see ponding, 
there's probably a problem with that practice that's not probably working as it's supposed to because sediment controls primarily work through ponding. Post construction, the construction drill permit says, you know, when we change this land use, we have this opportunity to handle the runoff a little bit better than what it was before and thereby treat some of this runoff and remove pollutants before it leaves the site, kind of mitigate for this, this new land use. Um, we have specific requirements for large sites, there's specific design standards, but what you would typically would see, um, you know, various practices, it could be uh, retention pond like was in the previous photos, uh, but here we have um, a green roof, and I think this is on the University of Toledo. Um, that's, I know, is UTF there in the corner with that, that central circle there is that permits, permits pavement. And down here in the right corner, um, this is more of a residential setting. This is a street over, uh, I think, Village of Orange, Northeast Ohio. And, you know, that's your rain garden. Um, the runoff from the front of the yards and the roads goes off into that side swale. And the catch basin lip is raised a bit, so first flush, you know, three quarters of an inch, inch of rain is going to come into this media. Um, soil mixture and filter through the soil before it gets discharged in the under drains. If the rain event's too large, it's going to surcharge, it's going to hit that catch basin and it'll discharge that way. But most rain events, probably 90% of them, are going to be captured and treated by this system. Now the other category of, of places that we regulate under the NPS is industries. Um, this is defined in the regs as by certain standard industrial classification codes um, and narrative descriptions. There's heavy industries, there's light industries, um, narrative codes or narrative descriptions would be places like um, recycling facilities. These places are all required to have an NPDES permit for their stormwater discharges from industrial activities. You know, what we're looking at here on these sites is um, you know, not just the process area, the manufacturing area, but also, you know, loading on the areas, um, material handling, material storage areas, what's being done there, what best management practices can we do to prevent stormwater pollution? There is an exception for this. Um, we do allow a conditional no exposure certification. Within <laughs> five years of industry can send in this no exposure certification form. They're swearing their life away that they have no exposure of activities or materials to stormwater runoff. They maintain that condition and they don't have to have an NPDES permit. So for the industrial general permit, um, or soon to be called the multi-sector general permit because we're in the process of renewing this, this permit statewide, what is required again? We're going to be able to plan that tells what BMPs are going to be implemented, when, how often, how things are going to be maintained. Um, it's a narrative, it's drawings, detailed drawings, a site map that shows how we have are going to be implemented. In this permit, the essential areas that we're looking at, which, which you have to have BMPs to address, are good housekeeping, preventive maintenance, spill response and prevention, um, inspections, employee training, sediment erosion control, they need to assess their facility for non-stormwater discharges. I don't care how new the building is. Believe me, somebody will do a cross-connection. It doesn't matter how new, how old, how familiar you are. Um, I encourage people to do a quick dive test and just verify where your drains are going. Because like Randy mentioned, you don't want to be at the downstream end of a spill and the cost and the cleanup that's going to occur. Not where you want to be. A dive test is really quick and simple. The only thing I advise people is contact your sewer authority, such as Randy, before you do it because if he or his streets department sees some funky color in their sewer, they're going to freak. <laughs> they're going to call our agency. We're going to freak. Um, and we'll be knocking at everybody's door in the neighborhood, and the whole neighborhood's going to know what you're doing. So one phone call, and, and most municipalities I know are very nice. They're even willing to come out and do it for you sometimes. So there's kind of a plus plus there. Um, but do check and see where your drains are going. It's, it's a little bit of peace of mind and insurance. Um, some industries under this permit do have to do stormwater monitoring. Um, and whether we go with the old permit or the new permit, 
the types of industries that have to be monitoring isn't really going to change much. Um, but it, it is there. It's, it's monitoring to see there are a few industries, you know, the monitoring subset that have effluent limits. And there's a number. You can't see this number of your oil and grease or, or something else. Um, most of the monitoring, though, really is kind of benchmarking and seeing are our BMPs working as we think they, they should be. So what would I be looking at on, on, a, on an industrial site? <coughs> and a lot of times, these things would be pertaining to commercial sites, too. Um, you know, again, material handling areas, material storage areas. You know, in, in this case, we have you know, some scrap and waste storage outside. We clearly have a lot of, of you know, particulate matter on the pavement there. Um, you know, down here in the bottom left, I have someone who, even though this is your covered loading and loading area, we've got some escaping. Um, but <coughs> to the right, we have a, a covered scrap storage area. Um, you know, still some housekeeping issues, but definitely when it rains, we're not going to have that mass bombardment of pollutants being carried off in the stormwater. Um, you know, here, a little housekeeping goes a long way. What the permit says is, you need to keep a clean and orderly facility. Sometimes that's really tough. It requires a constant presence, uh, keeping an eye on things, and you know, being quick response and cleaning stuff up. Um, you know, actually, this, the, the bottom right picture wasn't from an industry. That was from a municipality when I was doing an inspection. I don't know that they were trying to subliminally hint something here about how what wonderful stewards they were. <laughs> 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 I mean, there's no one behind them pushing them around, but hey, they were there. So I, I took the picture. Um, but clearly, you know, upper left there, there was definitely some housekeeping needed. That was um, that was actually at a flour mill. So you had a lot of grain sitting out, and you can imagine a little bit of rain, hot sun, rain. This stuff's going to go septic. The water's going to turn really nasty. It's not just going to smell, but it's going to suck the oxygen out of whatever receiving stream it's going into. Um, again, you know, kind of a night and day difference there. Material transfer area, a little bit of housekeeping, a little bit of spill prevention. Spill control would be, be welcomed in this one. You know, scoop up what you've, you've dropped. Um, using drip pans would be great. You know, bottom right, a better operation where we have the ports covered. Um, I've seen them where they have a little, more like a, a bucket kind of fashion underneath those spill ports so that when something does drip off, it's contained and just come in and clean that area up afterwards. Fueling is a common area, and this is again commercial, industrial, MS4. Doesn't matter whose permit you're under, fueling is, is a place to look at. Um, you know, secondary containment, something that we would like to see. Might even be required under the SPCC, Spill Prevention Control Countermeasures, regs from the US EPA. Um, you know, top right there, we have the area covered, so you know, you know we have the rain. Again, this is more like a volume control thing. You know, have the rain coming on to the area where you got pollutants, so we're not getting stuff carried away. Um, that spill kit there right by your fueling area. Labeled, stopped, <coughs> all set to go. Um, you know, on the top left here we have you know, anywhere where we're doing building washing, whether it's for paint removal, um, sometimes some hydro demolition activity. Um, when we're doing that kind of, of washing, there are pollutants in that water, even if it says biodegradable soap. So we need to be cautious about that. Um, those are wastewater. They should be directed to a sanitary sewer. Um, there are some very simple things, like in this case, you put some of this clean down. You can put a berm up on the side, you know, um, anything you can use to, to berm up the corners to, and that could be your collection point. You can take a shop back, a pump, suck that material up, and you know, properly dispose of it. Um, the bottom left, you know, again, Areas that are, are frequent for spills, or if you did have a spill, it would be a very nasty, nasty outcome. Simple valve. You know, be prepared to shut that off when you're doing material transfer. Um, you're prepared for any spill, and then you flip it back to discharging the storm sewer when you are sure that that area is clear and clean. Um, you know, again, these are, are very simple BMPs. You know, up top that was a hospital, salt storage, undercover, temporary structure that they have there. Bottom right, another industry, and you can't really tell on this one as well. Not only is this area covered, 
And this was a, not just material stores of drums, but they were actually, you know, transferring material to and from these barrels. And they are on, I forget what the name of the product is, they're little spill pallets. Um, so they're on their side, and there's a drip tray underneath it. And in the case of the drum will rupture, these drip trays underneath it will actually hold 110% of the drum's contents. Spill kits there on the back. Um, you know, we're prepared for any eventuality. Now, last but not least, um, and probably more relevant for the city of Finley folks, we also have NPS permits for municipal separate storm sewer systems, MS forms. This is the separate storm sewer system. So you do not go to the wastewater treatment plant. There is no treatment. And this is a term of art for US EPA. Because when we talk about separate storm sewer system, we don't just mean a pipe. We mean any stormwater plant, whether it's the gutter, whether it's the ditch, or an actual physical pipe. That is the separate storm sewer system. These are owned and operated by a public entity, not just the city of Philly, but it can also be a park district. It can also be, and it is ODOT. The Turnpike Commission, those are MS4 operators that we do regulate. Um, what does their permit require? Do you see a theme here? BMP implementation. You need a plan that says what BMPs you're going to implement to reduce or prevent stormwater pollution. And the permit's going to direct BMP implementation into six different areas, the six river control measures. Um, public education, public participation, all those discharges. <coughs> construction site, runoff, post-construction stormwater management, and pollution prevention for municipal operations. Which is basically, how does the city, when they're operating their storm sewer system, and when they're doing their daily business, how does the city do things in a manner which reduces or prevents pollution from getting into the storm sewers and discharging? Um, now here, you know, not so simple, but a little more elaborate effort. You know, public education, it can be a brochure. Are you gonna make an impact? Maybe yes, maybe no. In this case, the city of Marion had a float. And that was how they got some more awareness from their public. Um, and they actually had a mascot. And you can kind of see him, that's, that's their stormy, and I think he's supposed to be a storm drain cover. So, but you know, they went to the schools, they're in the, they're in the popcorn fest parade. Um, they got some care, they caught some people's attention. So, you know, it wasn't just the flyer that someone tossed to the side. You know, they had an audience. Um, now, we do have some performance standards that the cities have to meet. Um, I should say just cities, but the MS4s have to meet. And they have to use multiple mechanisms. They have to reach at least 50% of their population. Um, they have to have at least five public participation activities over the course of the five-year permit term. Well, it's discharge detection, elimination. The city, and this is actually, his was died, this is real. That is antifreeze that you're seeing in the storm sewer. Um, it was at a car wash. So, someone actually did a little extra housekeeping while they were at the car wash. Um, they need to have a program to detect illicit discharges and to eliminate them. So this is going to include an ordinance or some other kind of regulatory mechanism that says thou shalt not dump, thou shalt not make cross connections. They need to have a storm sewer system map so they know where everything goes in the event of a spill. Um, they also have to have some kind of plan on how they track down those discharges, what's their protocol for getting them removed, whether it's a violation letter to an entity, um, you know, a couple steps of, hey, we give you this notice to fix it if you don't then we might have to escalate enforcement. Um, they do need to address home sewage treatment systems because discharging home sewage treatment systems are not legal unless they are under an NPDES permit. The other thing that MS4 has to address is construction site runoff. And you know, this is very much similar to Ohio EPA's construction zone permit, except the municipality is administering it. They have that, they can get in the door first well, we're kind of after the fact. They're right there when plans are being discussed at the local level. This is a really good opportunity to talk to people about stormwater controls and implementation. Um, but the city is for construction sites of one acre and up, new development or redevelopment. They need to have a sediment erosion control program. Um, they also have to have a post-construction stormwater emission program. It's the same thing. What features are going to be incorporated in this new site treat stormwater runoff or mitigate its impacts as far as stormwater pollution goes. 
So for both construction and post-construction, the cities have to have an ordinance or some kind of regulatory mechanism that says you need to implement these controls. They have to do plan review. They have to do inspections. Um, on the post-construction, stormwater management side, they need to verify that these controls are actually being installed as they're supposed to be. There also needs to be a plan to ensure long-term operation and maintenance of these controls. Um, I can put a pond in, but we all know things happen. The groundhogs come in, the pipes clog, <coughs> when to use wrappers, whatever. But somebody has to, at least routinely, go back and make sure that they are being maintained. And lastly, what you don't want to see on a stormwater inspection is your maintenance yard dumping stuff over into the river. Um, Wish prevention for municipal operations. Again, here we go. Employee training. We need to make sure that our employees understand how they're supposed to handle things, how are they supposed to dispose of things, so that we're not adding pollutants to our streams. Under the P2 side, the cities have to look at, again, how do they do business? How do we do catch basin maintenance? How do we do street maintenance? When we do construction, are we doing sudden erosion controls when we bid things out? They need to look at how they're doing their business and have procedures in place to make sure proper reentries are being implemented, proper procedures are being followed to minimize stormwater pollution. Um, just some examples of what we see in the field, you know, salt storage, you need to have it covered as best as possible, it is preferable if they can get a structure where the loading and unloading occurs inside, that's even better. Um, there's a place called the Salt Institute. They have a website, it's an industry <coughs> website, and they have many recommendations about how to size sites <coughs> size for, for salt storage facilities, not just for ease of maintenance and, and material handling, but also for environmental considerations. Um, Top right there, that would be where the straight seedings and the catch basin cleanings go to dewater. And in this case, you know, I have places, I have one facility where they were right on the river and they dumped out the truck and the water came down and it went around the block wall and it went right to the river. So, you know, again, we have an opportunity to change that. And in this case, it was a sewered area. So you can put in a catch basin that actually connects the sanitary sewer and just that small area where the dewater is occurring, that water goes to the sanitary sewer, it doesn't go up into the stream. And then when they're done dewatering, they can scoop that material up and take it off to the landfill. Um, another area here, we have, you know, again, a little maintenance goes a long way. This isn't a structural control we need, this is just a little kind of loving care. So when it walks around, looks at, at, at our, our pipes, our outfalls, is something wrong, does something need to be repaired? Yes, it does, a little drip pan, fix that leak, and we're good to go. Other things you, you know, might be a little more structural control related. Obviously up top, we have a sediment problem. Sediment erosion control, we need some way to keep that dirt on site. Um, in this case, you know, it's, it's kind of a double whammy because not only are we discharging pollutants, we've completely filled in our drainage way. And I'm not sure why anybody would want to do that, especially in Northwest Ohio. We all know the importance of maintaining our drainage ways. We're too flat not to pay attention to this stuff. But options, you know, clearly we need to pave our road, put stone down on the road to minimize the erosion. Um, and we might need some sediment controls on the downstream end to capture that corn off and keep the dirt from entering into our ditches and streams. Uh, options would be, you know, on this lower left, we have a commercial site, and that's just a water quality swale. Curb cut lets the water come in. Depending on how you design this, you need a lot of infiltration. Down to the bottom, maybe there's an underdrain underneath. If you exceed a certain store, size storm event, it's going to overtop. Hit that riser pipe and discharge that way. So that we're not prevent, we're not causing flooding with these controls, but we are providing treatment for the smaller size storm events. Um, the right side there, that is Reynolds Road up in Toledo. Anybody ever been over that way? Did you notice lately that you have this beautifully landscaped area? And those are really stormwater controls. It looks great, it's a very attractive area. Um, but what we've done is the bioretention. We've got curb cuts going into a landscape area, which is a depression. It has you know, different soil types, so we're getting filtration through that soil. If we exceed a certain size storm event, what's going to happen is it fills up and it's going to go in over top into a nearby catch basin. 
So those are different ways. Um, Ohio State has at least some water. Randy talked about why. Obviously, we have you know stormwater pollution is an issue. We do need to address it. The way to do it is best management practices. Um, what I would encourage people to do when we're out in the field is you know look at your site and, and look at how you do business. Um, think about reducing exposure of activities that pollutes to stormwater. The last resort is treatment, but there are some treatment measures that are easily incorporated into a residential or commercial landscape or even industrial landscape. Um, they're not only aesthetically pleasing, but they do provide some environmental benefit too. Um, and if you have questions about the, the program, you know, we regulate construction, industrial, and the spores. Um, but the, the push here is this is our tool with the NPDES permits to get BMP implementation on the ground. 